Hi, Hi everybody. everybody. Thank you. Good. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. It's my first, my inaugural uh, stint with you guys. And uh, so far, so good. It's beautiful. It's wonderful speakers. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be among them. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to give a, um, a slide talk. Um, hopefully, it'll be reasonably entertaining. Um, and then maybe we'll get to questions I prefer at the end. Um, but I want to... Um, to really give the big picture on drinking water as I discovered it as not an engineer, not as a biochemist or a toxicologist, um, but where I began my journey into environmental health, which I didn't even know what that was, even as a practicing physician, um, about nine or 10 years ago. And it really launched me into this world um, and really wondering how I never knew about any of this. And then if I didn't know anything about many of these topics, certainly my colleagues did not as well. So I'm going to launch right in, forgive the glasses, but I am old. So let me go to screen share. Okay. And then I think I do play from start. Okay, great. So um, let me move this up here. Um, so I want to talk about, oops, I don't know if I can go forward. Here we go. I want to talk about clean drinking water, which has really emerged for me as the big topic. I mean, I, I am covering cosmetics, personal care products, cleaning products. Um, we just did a big monograph, my co-author and I, Dr. Fred Bomsal, um, air pollution and its risk to human health. But out of all of the topics that I have now um, sort of delved into over the last um, nine years with two books, this one has really become the emerging issue for me. And the reason I, I say that to begin with is because of just the amount of drinking water that we all need to consume. But on a, in addition to that, just how little we all know about the topic. So this, this disconnect is so shocking to me. Um, and of course I was part of it before I knew anything, but in general, I think this is a really important topic um, that we all need to understand and, and understand the options because I'm all about the options and the solutions. So let's get started, let's see. Ah, so this was actually my slide in this talk um, a few years ago, and it couldn't be more um, important even now, now that we have um, been living in a worldwide pandemic, um, these hazmat suits could not be more um, frightening and yet uh, so apropos. Um, I talked about and made the audience laugh with chemicals that we're now exposed to, but now, of course, we can extend that to viruses um, and, and potentially more to come. Um, so it was meant to make a chuckle, but I, I've left it in because it really is almost more pertinent now than it even was a few years ago, um, but not to scare people away from solutions. Again, I think that's really kind of critical to not just present harmful or harm, information about harmful chemical exposures and radiation, some other topics, but to always preface by saying there will be solutions at the end of the talk or end of the discussion. So the first question I ask everybody, including my patients, about any topic really is, well, why should we care? I mean, why should it take up any space in our brain? Um, why should we um, you know, really think about this being an issue if it doesn't really bother us? I mean, chemicals in general, most chemicals, you know, really don't smack you in the face, right? They don't necessarily give you a rash. Um, certainly the thousands and thousands that we're exposed to, um, you know, at this rate, we're at about 95,000 in the United States per, you could estimate more, but 95,000 chemicals that are now available um, in the uh, consumer market to, in all our products in the United States. Each year now, uh, just to give some statistics, um, there are over a thousand new chemicals that are put into use. At least 15 new polymers are patented um, in the United States every week. Um, there are over a thousand likely endocrine disrupting chemicals that currently exist, which we'll talk about what are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, and only five chemicals have ever been banned in the United States under the Toxic Substance Control Act, which was passed in 1976, which was under the Ford administration. Um, so you can see that we have a very difficult time in this country um, writing or executing any legislation that protects consumers from environmental chemicals that we now know are harmful. And um, in fact, Europe does a much better job. They have much more stringent 
um, and rigorous um, oversight. Uh, they have upwards of 1,200 chemicals that have been removed from their markets when, when the evidence shows that there's harm. Um, on, in this country, unfortunately, um, we are stuck in a situation where the consumer is the last to know and manufacturing is biased. Um, and we are biased towards manufacturing in terms of laws and regulations. Um, and in fact, we are not privy to any information regarding ingredients in the products we use in our, uh, as cosmetics, personal care products, um, feminine care products. Um, so it is quite a problem. Now, I also like to discuss very briefly the concept of anthropology and how that plays into not only all of my medical work and all of my research, because I think if we don't bring in the conversation of anthropology and evolution, um, and understanding how we got into this pickle, we're missing a very big piece of the puzzle. Um, we have been evolving. Uh, Earth is over 4.6 billion years old. Um, we as human beings have been evolving more or less 4.5 million years. You could argue 250,000 for our latest, you know, for Homo sapiens, but a really long time. And we have had all of these 95 plus thousand uh, industrial chemicals um, in our lives for just about 100 years, maybe 150, you could argue, but really about 100 years. So as a clinician, as someone who's seeing more and more autoimmune diseases, I'm an autoimmune disease specialist as a rheumatologist, um, seeing more thyroid conditions, hyper, hypo, thyroiditis, um, thyroid cancers, cancers, um, certainly endocrine um, sensitive cancers like endometrial, uterine, um, prostate, um, thyroid. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see more and more disease um, and the numbers will support this epidemiologically at younger and younger ages. But I have began to feel this even over the last 20 years of practicing medicine that I'm seeing younger and younger um, patients with chronic illnesses, illnesses that you would expect to see you know, maybe later in life after maybe a lifetime of exposure, as well as acute issues such as, you know, food allergies, um, which, you know, is un unheard of now. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of that asthma, um, food allergies, so both acute and chronic illnesses, but I personally was affected by the fact that I saw this in my practice and I continue to see this in my practice. So from an anthropology perspective, we are just getting inundated with chemicals that have no required testing prior to going into the products that we use, sometimes using every day, multiple times a day over the course of a lifetime. Um, and our systems are getting, you know, um, irritated. They're getting irritated by these exposures. And in fact, not just individual chemicals have been shown to be problematic, which Again, there's many, but we, we can certainly find time to go into some of them. But when you have mixtures, mixtures of chemicals, in addition to medications, um, you can really start to see how it's not just one issue that could be a problem, but multiples that cause a synergistic effect, hormonally, immune system wise, cancer risk, and so forth. But I'm very clear to say to my patients, to um, groups I speak to, high school students that I do a lot of work with, that whether we develop an illness, whether we you know, develop a cancer or develop perhaps thyroid condition or, or develop um, acne, migraines, a lot of these things um, are based on this intricate dance between our genetics um, our environment, of course, you know, things that we put on in and around our bodies, we breathe, um, but also our lifestyle. And that's where my integrative medicine training really gave me some great insight into this. Things like sleep quantity and quality make a huge difference in not only cognition and memory, um, but also in pain levels, pain evaluation, but also in inflammatory response in terms of inflammation, in terms of managing chemicals and removing them in and around the brain in our lymphatic system, whether we smoke, whether we sit out in the sun, um, smoking and UV radiation from sun are one-to-one -one direct cause and effects of environmental exposures. There's very few things in this world that you can, um, you know, uh, argue that aren't confounded by other components of lifestyle, such as nutrients or sedentary lifestyle or chemicals. 
but we know that radiation, particularly skin cancers and lung cancers are pretty much a one-to-one -one, um, dose um, uh, connection. And um, our, our processed food intake and all the chemicals that are involved with that, with low nutrient value, whether we exercise, whether we drink wine or not drink wine, any alcohol, all of these things together are what in some way determine our health um, expression. You know, we call this the exposome. We do know, however, that lifestyle and environmental exposures are two things that we can control. Genetics are not easy. Um, to control. You can't just change your genetic profile. But we now know that environment, um, stress, sleep, diet, exercise, and lifestyle all contribute a great deal to whether or not those genetic sequences will express disease. And again, we call that the exposome if you want to dive into de that deeper. And so what that tees up is the question of you have more control over our future health risks than we even think about. And that is a lot of the work I do with these books um, is really, and teaching is really give people an idea at the beginning of the story that yes, what I'm about to cover is tough stuff, but the punchline is we have more control um, over the future, our future health um, potential um, than we think, and even the potential of our offspring, which we're going to talk about. So this slide is just to give an idea, um, you know, how endocrine disruption works in the human body. Um, and to start off with, human hormones are incredibly sensitive. We've evolved, again, anthropology, we've evolved to have, uh, to, to conserve the functions of the human body for survival. And one of those conserved uh, activities is to be able to messenger around the human body, different physiologic effects, um, growth development, puberty, menopause, um, brain development, body development, um, you know, whether or not our thyroid functions in terms of a feedback loop, our pineal gland. So hormones are essentially um, very key uh, uh, messengers. And not only do they have to be created to get to that site, they also have to have receptors like a baseball mitt and a baseball to catch that message. It turns out that many of these environmental chemicals specifically entitled or called endocrine disrupting chemicals have now known information um, on how they can disrupt the process of that messaging system, whether it's reducing the amount of hormone that's released from a, uh, a, a hormone, um, an endocrine organ, whether or not it's the number, the reduction in receptors uh, of where that messenger will be received. Um, we know with um, certain chemicals like bisphenol A and phthalates that we can have multiple effects. You can have reduction of androgen um, hormones, which are male hormones, and you can have the mimicking, even at very, very low levels, parts per million, parts per trillion, uh, mimicking estrogenic chemicals. And so what's so key about all of this is that, you know, we need our, our physiology to work properly and be conserved. Um, and yet these chemicals are now being, you know, infiltrated into our systems um, at very, very low levels, but of course, over time. And over time plus low levels is quite important. Um, Time Magazine made, the, you know, created this cover, um, I believe it was October in 2010. And really it described how the first nine months shaped the rest of your life, but understanding how those environmental exposures in utero exposure to chemicals can have effects on the health of that child as they are born and move into adulthood. And, um, you know, these are, these are quite important, these, um, this evidence, and there's quite a bit of evidence to this, that the in utero exposure is really quite, quite important to normal brain development. And even in the case of phthalates as a class, which was done by Dr. Shauna Swan, we know that, um, you know, phthalates can decrease the anogenital distance, which is a measure of androgenic exposure or reduced exposure in um, not only lab animals, but in humans as well. And that phthalates can in fact um, change the, uh, the outcome of male genitalia when they're born. Um, and so that can be dose response related to the, number, to the amount of phthalates in the blood system of that infant. Um, and so these are really key issues that what we do not only matters to us now, if you're an adult listening, 
but it matters to our children and the choices they make, which is why high school education has become a key issue in my, um, my work and now moving forward. So we need to talk to all generations about these issues so that if they choose one day to have children, um, they would make better choices perhaps leading up to getting pregnant and staying pregnant and while they're pregnant and even after they've given birth so that their children get reduced exposures to many harmful chemicals. Um, let me move on. So what are endocrine disrupting chemicals? So this is just one, dis uh, one definition. Endocrine disrupting chemicals um, are chemicals that may interfere with the body's endocrine system and produce adverse developmental, reproductive, neurologic, and immune effects in both humans and wildlife. Um, and again, potential effects on fetus, infants, adolescents. And these critical windows of development are quite interesting because we now know that when we have hormones that are being created at, at um, large quantities during certain parts of development, of course, in utero, toddler, puberty, and even menopause, which we'll talk about, um, that those are the windows that are considered very vulnerable and could perhaps be um, an avenue by which um, harmful chemicals that are endocrine disrupting in nature can have their, their greatest effects clinically. We do know from an epidemiologic study that many endocrine, dis endocrine disorders, meaning that they're connected to this hormonal system that's so vulnerable, um, have changed in terms of, um, you know, increased risk for problems. We know infertility among Northern Europeans has increased dramatically. If anyone's heard the latest book, um, Countdown, by a colleague, Shauna Swan, who wrote an actual um, a wonderful chapter in our textbook of, uh, in 17, 2017, that was a really eye-opening, um, you know, book that described her research over many, many years discussing infertility and how that's being affected um, by our environment and, and specifically chemicals, among other things. 20 to 40% of, of European males um, now have decreased sperm quality in the subfertile range. We know that quantity has also decreased dramatically. Um, radiation also plays a key role in this. I'll be discussing some of this tonight um, with uh, Theo Theodora Scorato when we talk about radiation. Uh, exposure and what to teach kids and how to handle our tech toys. Um, but I also have a very nice chapter in my new book, Non-Toxic, on um, tech toys and how to handle radiation, how to explain it, and how to understand how to use it safely. Um, cryptochidism, that is changes in male genitalia, has increased um, at birth, um, and uh, that increases risk for testicular cancer. So for instance, testes, testes not dropping um, in young babies, uh, newborn male babies at birth, that increases risk for testicular cancer later on. Preterm birth and low birth weight, of course, is associated with endocrine disruption, um, especially in um, more polluted environments, many um, major cities, but third world countries particularly. Um, trends toward earlier onset of breast development in all countries where this has been studied, we now know that we are shifting um, puberty to a much earlier um, age where it used to be um, you know, a century or two ago, age 17, age 16, when young women would develop um, the beginnings of puberty, we now are at the time where it's eight, nine years old now. Um, and as a subgroup, African-American female girls um, are experiencing this, experiencing this um, in, in greater quantity. And it's perhaps related to some of the specific um, marketed and used um, chemicals in hair products for young girls and African-American women. So this is a separate area that I talk about and certainly bring up in high schools. Um, global rates of endocrine related cancers have certainly been increasing um, breast and mitral ovarian, as I mentioned, and obesity and type two diabetes has certainly skyrocketed worldwide. Um, and that is in fact, because insulin is, an, is a hormone in the body that does get disrupted. Um, classic chemicals are BPA, phthalates, um, PBDE, um, I'm sorry, uh, flame retardant, uh, brominated flame retardants, um, and many of the flame retardant chemicals that are um, fluorinated. So we are starting to see that environment and the products we use and the products we don't intentionally use um, can affect everything, even, even our, our fat cells growing larger or smaller, and whether or not we're um, becoming insulin resistant. I will add to this mix a topic that I'll be talking about in the future. I'm working on a new um, uh, book in the future in regards to uh, immune system effects from chemicals. Um, and the literature is robust. And so we'll start to see 
um, how some of the not just classified as endocrine disrupting chemicals, but chemicals that can affect other aspects of our body and different systems will take, take have been shown to, um, uh, you know, exist. So I want to just talk a little bit about how these endocrine disrupting chemicals do, in fact, have they been discovered to be endocrine disruptors? So Paracelsus back in, in the 1500s um, was sort of the father of toxicology and toxicologists use the expression dose makes the poison. Um, in other words, as you get exposed to a dose or an exposure of some kind, the more you're exposed, the more you're going to have the reaction that fits that, that exposure level. Um, I like to use with my high school students, uh, well, actually not my college students, actually not my high school students. Um, you know, if you drink a lot of alcohol, you're going to get sick, right? Dose makes the poison. Um, if you eat a lot of cake, you're going to maybe get a bellyache. Um, you know, so the dose makes the poison. Um, what was discovered almost haphazardly about 20 some years ago um, was that no one's ever bothered to look at the low, 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 low levels, the parts per million, parts per trillion, levels of exposure until it was an accident. And what was discovered is even at the lowest, lowest doses, such, I mean, at the levels of what hormones run around the human body, at those levels, you could see the same effects as the high dose exposures. And this was like dumbfounded. Um, because why would anyone look below those, those levels where you could start to visibly see a clinical change? And so as you can see, I think you can see my pointer, these were dose makes the poison kind of a linear and almost a nonlinear um, exposure um, graph. But when you look at um, hormones as well as endocrine disruptors, you can see that it's almost like a U or a J, which is non-monotonic, meaning at low levels that no one ever bothered to look at, now we're looking, you can start to see some of the, of the changes, the responses um, as similar to the high dose exposures. And that was alarming and something that the American chemical companies um, really fought to, um, to quiet. And so it's been a very insular area of research until now it's worldwide. So I mentioned periods of susceptibility. Um, so it's not just what one is exposed to, but also when. And this was um, also discovered in the literature that, um, again, those, those exposure periods um, when they're involved with lots of hormonal change going up or going down, as in the case of menopause, that is when perhaps these windows um, of more harm could take place. So um, when it comes to exposure during pregnancy, um, you know, we have the fetal um, alcohol uh, charts, which are very important. Um, we have a chart like this in, in our um, consumer book, Dr. Vamsal and I. We wanted to kind of show people that there are different time periods um, when different organs or different systems in the human body are developed in utero, in, in pregnancy. And you can see that there are certain areas where um, external genitalia is generally um, developed. Um, certainly the central nervous system goes all the way through for all of the weeks of uh, gestation. Um, and this is again, um, an alcohol exposure chart. Um, but when we talk about certain chemicals, we now know, uh, or classes of chemicals, we now know that they too can affect certain um, developmental uh, stages of in utero development. And this becomes pretty important because we now have incredibly high rates of autism, as we know. Um, in fact, I'm in New Jersey, where my practice is, and I grew up here, um, and we are one of the dirtiest states in the country, go Jersey. Um, we have one of the highest um, rates of autism. We have one of the highest rates of breast cancer incidence um, in terms of diagnosis. And um, we have the most super fun, <laughs> super fun sites of anywhere in the country, whether you wanna make those connections. Um, I don't have any specific ways to connect them, but um, I wanna just at least put that information out there. Um, and perhaps that'll come into play when we talk about other topics like drinking water, um, you know, in the U.S. as we're going to get into. But again, a lot of things contribute to this issue, nutrient value, et cetera. Um, but I wanted people to understand that it's not just even one class of chemicals that could have effects. Um, it's the mixture. It's the mixture of getting BPA from these products, um, 
preservatives from these foods, air quality, inhalation, um, being perhaps not nutrient sufficient to manage these chemicals, adding some stress, adding a dose of um, poor sleep, all of these things do contribute. So um, I don't want anyone to be so scared that they're resistant to hearing the messages of change. Um, call to action on neurotoxin exposure. So um, this is a wonderful um, piece uh, that came out in, let me go back to my notes. Um, this came out in, uh, let's see, July, 2016 issue of JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. It was a call to action um, to reduce exposures to toxic chemicals that can contribute to the prevalence of neurodevelopmental disabilities in American children. Um, at that time, one in 68 children had autism spectrum disorder. That was the 2016 information. One in 10 U.S. children had ADHD. Uh, we now know from the 2018 uh, data that it's now one in 48 children has autism spectrum disorder nationally. In New Jersey, I believe it's one in 32 um, as of 2018 data. So I'm just worried as all get out to see what the 2020 data looks like. Um, but I want people to think not just in terms of plastics, which um, is certainly a key contributor, but also the, the neurotoxins that are heavy metals um, and exposures to air pollution that turn into exposures that you wouldn't necessarily think of because you're inhaling it versus ingesting. Now, I did talk a, very briefly about transgenerational effects, which is, means that um, essentially whatever we do as adults or even as pregnant women specifically and pregnant, pre-pregnant men, I mean, men aren't off the hook. We now know that men are exposed to many chemicals and that contributes somewhat of risk towards their new or unborn fetus, I should say. Um, we do know that from with transgenerational effects that when a pregnant woman is exposed to anything, I mean, we know this, anything, including stress, right? The Dutch famine was a really interesting um, area to study in terms of um, famine during World War II and pregnant women who were exposed to severe famine versus those who weren't. We now know that those children develop health issues that were in the famine group much more so than those who were not. So in terms of stress of the mother, um, many exposures that affect a pregnant woman affect not just her, her body, but, not, but the fetus, a so growing fetus. And then of course we have reproductive germ cells within the fetus that's growing within us. Um, babies, baby girls have all the eggs that they'll always have um, at the time of birth. Um, boys will have germ cells, they'll have the, the pre, precursor cells, the precursor structures that they will be using the rest of their lives in terms of um, their reproductive future. So again, there are literally three generations that are exposed to anything that a, pre, a female that's pregnant is exposed to, um, which is a little spooky, but we have to, you know, really think about how we um, convey these messages um, to family, to um, colleagues, to patients, and so on. Um, so children are uniquely vulnerable, pound for pound. They're close to the ground. Their hand-to-mouth behavior um, is very um, interesting because they do collect dust on their toys, dust that often has a lot of harmful chemicals, including phthalates, which are very high up on that list when it was studied, BPA, flame retardant chemicals, they land in dust um, and create a dust ball, cleaners, those kind of things. Um, and then they get stuck to the hands and toys. And this is the same for pets. I'm not sure if people know my story, um, but I tell the story in my book, um, I'll just hold it up, non-toxic. The introduction is all how I got into this. And it really began with the, um, the sad sickness of my golden retriever, my uh, firstborn. So I want people to think, you know, pets are just as vulnerable. We now know that cats certainly can get hyperthyroidism um, that was described um, and is now pretty common amongst house cats uh, due to endocrine disruption of many household chemicals. So children, they lack a variety of, in their diet, in terms of nutrients that are actually protective. Um, so they're very narrow diet. Um, their metabolism system is, is uh, met metabolic system is very immature. Um, they don't quite have the stage two conjugation, um, you know, breakdown ability that adults have. Um, they're continuously developing. Um, so they're not really fully cooked. Um, and so these exposures can have particular um, health issues in terms of cognition, IQ. We've seen this with lead um, that was uh, taken out of uh, paints and gasoline. 
um, in the 70s, 1978, but now we're seeing a resurgence, of course, of, of lead exposure from infrastructure. Um, and Flint was a prime example, but I'll talk about that. We have lots of other exposures to lead across the US. Um, and they have many more years of future life ahead of them. So, um, you know, I talk about how I got introduced to sushi in my 20s. And I loved it. And what I realized is that had I been exposed to sushi like my two kids at age four, five, six, especially with the problems with our oceans in terms of quality of our fish, I, you know, I realized that that's a lot of reason why a lot of people perhaps are living very, very long old ages that were born in the turn of the century. So, you know, our exposure and what age and how long and for years of future, I think is very important to think about. And we handle their sushi very carefully, by the way, um, in case anyone's going to ask me that question. Let me see if I can overturn. Let's see. Here we go. Um, so in terms of drinking water, I want to get back to why you probably tuned in, um, but I just want to give the backstory and how why that's important. Drinking water in the U.S. is complicated, and I'm hoping to make this really not complicated. And first, I wanted to start with all of the choices that we have in front of us. Um, wherever you live, you have the choice of municipal versus well, depending on where you live and how far from water treatment plants, um, versus bottled water. Um, there are 160,000 in the United States, 160,000 water treatment, wastewater treatment plants, 160,000. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, and what are the risks to that, but we also have wells, private wells, wells that serve um, small towns, wells that serve neighborhoods, wells that serve individual homes. And they have their issues as well as do bottled water. Um, we have the choice of filtering or unfiltered our filtering our water or buying water that's filtered or unfiltered. Um, we have different types of filtration systems we can employ. Um, and then that also draws into question water sustainability, particularly people who have water restrictions like in California. We have glass bottles versus carboys, you know, which are the big blue plastic containers that are in office buildings and office water, um, uh, uh, refrigerated water. Um, I don't know why I'm blanking, but anyway, um, uh, you know what those big blue things are. And you can see them outside of many big box stores like Home Depot and Lowe's and they're just kind of piled up. So you have choices of glass versus those or, or stainless steel or the waste of carrying your water. There's also water testing um, issues that I wanna briefly talk about as we go through this. And I wanna talk about, as I mentioned, water bottles, the differences in those, because that's also an opportunity where contaminants can make their way into the drinking water we drink. So um, this is um, a committee opinion from the um, obstetrician gynecologist in 2013. This was their first um, actual uh, position statement, which came out in 2013, which seems awfully recent. Um, but this is uh, one of their issues. And they their opinion basically states that reducing exposure to toxic uh, environmental agents is a critical area of intervention for obstetricians, gynecologists, and other reproductive health professionals. And, you know, what this really is saying is we are really missing a huge amount of information that needs to get to our patients. But I put this in here to talk about drinking water with pregnant women, especially given the exposure risks and given what we're now finding in the obstetrician gynecology world and, and neonatology world. Um, during pregnancy, just to talk, go back to this topic for a second, neurons are being formed at a rate of 250,000 per minute on average over the course of a pregnancy. And that's a lot of opportunity for things to go awry. So when we get that number in our head, you can see how vulnerable um, the brain is, okay? So I wanted to make sure I just got that in there. Now, drinking water. Starting at the very basics, we most of us have heard this. We are made of water. We're made of water. Different parts of the human body have different levels of concentration of water in those organs, but essentially the human body is made of a large proportion of water. So the question really is, why are we not really paying attention to this? Um, I find, you know, even being part of the health and wellness world with my, you know, my foot in there, my foot in Western medicine, my foot in environmental health, that no one really talks about water um, in terms of exposures per body mass index over time and why instead of worrying so much about 
what I should eat fats or proteins or keto or, um, you know, South beach or paleo or this or that or whatever. I never really get a lot of people shouting on mountaintops about water, water quality and why it's so important. So hopefully this will um, open people's eyes. Water in the human body is used for a number of um, reasons. We moisten our air when we breathe it in. We carries nutrients to cells. It regulates the pH of the human body. That, that's so key, especially the kidneys work to do this as well. Regulates body temperature, which is going to be important as we move into higher temperatures. Um, it protects and cushions our vital organs. It cushions joints. Of course, I have a lot of rheumatology patients. And as we get older, we lose water content in a lot of our tissues. And um, that, that leaves uh, an issue for us when it comes to uh, rotator cuff tears and Achilles you know, rupture without doing very much. And a lot of that has to do with water content. Um, it also removes waste and toxins through sweat, through urine, through feces, um, through our GI system, through our vaginal canal. So we have all of these ways that we eliminate water and water is part of what it pulls some of these harmful chemicals. So let's talk about the different types of water systems. We have in public drinking water, we have, again, as I mentioned, 186 more or less public water um, treatment plants um, in the U.S. About 86% of the U.S. relies on water from these public treatment plants. And that's really important. So the vast majority of the U.S. drinks from city water, tap water. Um, the public water supply, by definition, anything that's considered a public water supply has to have at least 15 connections, whether it's 15 homes, 15 schools, 15 apartment buildings, what have you, but it also ha has to serve at least 25 people. So that's the definition by the EPA. Public water supply comes 80% from surface sources and 20% from groundwater underneath the ground. So again, most of our water comes from the surface of the, of the earth, lakes, streams, sewage. People don't like to hear that, but sewage is actually turned into drinking water um, and everything that goes into sewage, which we'll talk about. But again, I wanted you to get the big picture um, here is that most of our water really comes from what, what's on the surface of the earth. Um, and that's quite important when you think about what's on the surface of our earth. Um, more than 97% of 160,000 U.S. public water systems serve fewer than 10,000 people. So again, based on population also uh, directs how much testing and how regularly testing is done on these locations. I'll repeat that. Big cities get tested more, have more oversight, have more um, um, evaluations, more regular testing than say a very, very rural public system. Even if it's connected to public water, it still gets tested less frequently. Follows the same laws uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, but that doesn't uh, directly affect the amount of testing in terms of intervals. So that's pretty important. So this was an image um, from our book we put together, we designed, um, it's really quite important. Um, it is showing many, visually, many of the ways that water is contaminated, um, whether it's above, you know, sort of surface water versus aquifers, which were lower, deeper into the earth, they have their own issues, but pretty much waste from manufacturing plants, runoff from agricultural pesticides like nitrates, nitrites, gasoline leaks, we have lots of, um, uh, you know, storms um, nowadays that are affecting water supplies. Um, we saw that in Texas with the freezing water, freezing conditions. We see that in, um, you know, oil spills. We see it in flooding conditions. Um, animal waste and dead animals certainly make their way into our water system from rains. Um, but we have drugs that are flushed into the water supply from our toilets. Um, antidepressants, blood pressure medications, and anti-anxiolytics, um, you know, um, anti-inflammatories, opiate um, degradation products. So we have lots of stuff that comes from urine that will make its way into or towards a, um, a water treatment plant. Um, and then of course there are things that are added, chemicals that are have to be added in many ways to the, the water that comes to a treatment plant to disinfect. And that can include chlorine, um, ammonia, and we'll talk about that. And then it comes out and goes to 
houses, homes, schools from that water treatment plant. Um, and it could travel maybe 30, 40 miles like my company does. Um, it may be very close, but it's going to go through either lead piping or PVC piping or some type of piping. And after the water leaves that municipal treatment plant, they're done. So whatever comes to your house, good luck. Um, basically it's any, it's, you know, anything that comes from that, that unit, the treatment plant people I've interviewed them. I've done three hour tours. They do everything they're supposed to. They do everything right. Um, and they have the screens up and they're looking for, um, you know, terrorism in the water system. They're, they're just doing a great job of what they are supposed to do. It's really the overall picture of, of the laws and what happens to this water, uh, in terms of its infrastructure um, that we have to be concerned about. So monitored water, water contaminants under our, our Safe Drinking Water Act um, of 1974, which we, by the way, still follow now. Um, it's looking for microorganisms. It's looking for like bacteria, viruses, fungi. It's looking for disinfectants. Um, we're looking to cap some of these levels off. So there's these maximum contaminant levels that are um, managed for, for many of the things that are in our water, particularly um, benzene and atrazine and some of the fertilizers. But these are the groups of things that are monitored um, in terms of their classes through the wastewater treatment plants. Now, this is a shocker, and I hope people will, will hear, I'll repeat it twice. Um, and I couldn't believe this when I heard this nine years ago. Currently, the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974 mandates the monitoring and regulation of 91 contaminants in public water. So earlier I said we have over 95,000 uh, industrial chemicals that can and do get into um, our products, get into our world, our products, our fashion that gets washed down the, you know, the, uh, the washing machine, down our sinks, um, but they're in our, in our um, consumer world. And under the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974, that still holds now, only 91 contaminants have a maximum contaminant level, MCL, that are monitored. And here's an example. If you wanted to go to the, um, you could look this up very easily. And this was just a screenshot of one of the pages that says what the contaminant is, what they consider safe in terms of maximum contaminant level. Um, and so they'll monitor this um, whenever they're checking those sites, um, what these potential chemicals have in terms of their risk, if they go above, according to the EPA. Um, and um, you can access this anytime you want. So really what we're saying is even in the last 50 years where we've had an enormous influx of environmental chemicals added to our world, that get into our water, we still are not able to increase that from 91 to something higher. Um, and so you get what you get basically with these MCLs. Now, to make it more clear, I wanted to show people what goes into what's in the water before a treatment plant potentially, and then what essentially comes out the other side, assuming that the water treatment plant does some cleaning of our water. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, they want to get rid of and look for bacteria and stuff like that. Well, these are the things that go into the one side of the treatment plant, potentially. And we're talking things like coal ash, which is the waste from coal plants, heavy metals, fracking chemicals. Um, anything that's air in our air will potentially settle on surface waters um, that will make their way into the treatment plant. Um, but, you know, PFAS chemicals that we've heard a lot about, the nonstick chemicals, they don't break down. They end up in the water system from uh, airports and um, fire training programs because they're usually in fire foam. Um, and then, of course, microplastics. Um, so you can see a lot of stuff gets into our water before from, you know, before it gets to the treatment plant. And then after it comes out, guess what? Most of it just comes out the other side. Plus the addition of detergents and chlorine and chlorinated chemicals that are added to that water to clean it so that we don't end up with major infections nationally. Um, but we don't end up having, for most people, don't have a system to remove those added chlorinated chemicals, ammonia, um, 
and detergents and detergent breakdown chemicals before they get to our drinking glass. So they're added to the treatment centers and they're basically sent out the door. Now, well water is a different issue. It serves fewer people generally. Um, about 44 million more or less will rely on private wells and they are subject to their own regulation, but pretty much nothing. You're only required to um, test well water for a very limited number of contaminants um, in term, before selling your home. Other than that, it's up to the homeowner um, or the school that uses that well, for instance. Um, and um, many things can affect wells. Um, certainly flooding and natural disasters, which we're seeing more and more of, um, you know, so these are the types of things, fertilizers, nitrates, nitrites from off, you know, um, fertilizing operations, agriculture operations, um, will make its way into water. And then certainly that can get into wells, depending on how deep, shallow or deep those wells are. Um, and they really are supposed to be checked at least once a year for some of the key contaminants that cause real human harm, like nitrates, nitrites, um, which can cause something called blue baby syndrome. Um, these are environmental training information that I never learned in medical school. Um, so they're held to a different, worse standard in terms of it's a free for all, but they do get contaminated by a lot of things like radioactive substances that, are, that form naturally in um, the earth's soil and in lower surfaces below. So contaminated wells, water, again, these are some of the contaminants that you can see in, in wells. Um, fracking chemicals make their way, you know, soil is like tissue paper and it can travel, chemicals can travel um, for miles and miles and miles. One of my favorite books ever is called Tom's River, um, especially as a New Jersey resident, Tom's River is the story of the Sibagaygi contamination of wells in South uh, Jersey. Um, and all of the increase in um, childhood cancers that were discovered from those wells. Um, so I think if you want a good read this summer, it's won the Pulitzer for uh, writing. It was just terrific. Um, that's worth um, looking into. It's Tom's River by Dan Fagan. Anyway, so that was just one of those stories that just never left me and taught me about soil and how it really can have a far reach um, and really opened my eyes. I grew up on a farm with a well, and we did not have a filter. So, you know, it's interesting to look back. Um, here we go. Uh, there's also legacy chemicals, of course, DDT, things that were banned, you know, 30, 40 years ago are still in our soil because of the way they were designed, those compounds with um, a lot of times halogens connected to them. Now, I wanted to talk about public water contamination. A lot of the times we don't think about our water until it makes the evening news. Um, and it causes a lot of stir in one section of the country. And we think, oh, it's them, not us, because who really reads their water reports that are, you know, required um, once a year that you're entitled um, to have a report of your water system if you have uh, municipal water. Um, but I wanted to show different things that might have um, struck some memory to the people that in watching this that it was really kind of, uh, it's kind of one of those things that we don't do anything until we kind of see it on the news and then we start to panic and then we kind of forget. Um, let's talk about a couple contaminants really quickly. Um, lead is not just in Flint, Flint, Michigan. It was banned from gasoline, as I mentioned, in the 1970s, um, but it's still in the solder and the joints of old plumbing, which many people, I live in a hundred year old um, farm house that we know that there's lead somewhere underneath there. Um, new piping is PVC piping, which is not really better in many regards, but lead is certainly worse. We know that there is no safe level of lead um, for the human body, particularly for growing, developing children in terms of their IQ. Lead in the blood stigs around 25 days and soft tissue about 40 days and bone about 20 years. Um, so I always find that fascinating that, um, you know, once you're exposed, you really, it's a clock to, to kind of get it out of your system. Um, I also worry about bone broth. I'll just make it a point to say that. I'm not saying that there's really been any major studies to show this, but when we hold metals and uh, particularly lead in bone, depends on you know, where we're getting our food sources, but you wanna be conscious of not doing things in moderation is my only um, comment. I use bone broth, but you wanna be thinking about that as well. Um, anything about bone, you wanna think about what stores into that tissue 
just like liver. I mean, you know, eating liver, um, you want to start thinking about is that um, always the safest way or just in moderation is really the way I go. All right. Lead. Children are more susceptible to the effects of neurotoxins. I think most people would agree with that, but it's really been studied. It's been really found to be true. And that's why lead was removed from um, so many products in the 70s. Um, it actually increased aggressiveness. There was um, a correlation with inmates and in jails. Um, it was getting stored for very long periods of time. And so that's how they looked at children's teeth to evaluate lead, lead exposure. Um, but it has other health effects, not just um, neurocognitive. We have effects on blood like anemia um, and um, delayed growth as well um, and cognition. Um, so that was a real public health success. Um, and we, we actually give a, a nice history of that. Fred Vomsal is my partner and he, he's really invested in all of the regulatory issues. This, this has been his world as a bench researcher for 50 years. And he uh, did a nice overview of, uh, and as, you know, as we both did on certain major classes and, and some of the successes we've had in terms of managing chemicals in our history. So I wanted to mention here about schools. This was a study that was done in, let's see, this was a 2018 study um, from the US Government Accountability Office, the GAO, and what they found was 25 states and Washington DC um, test, tested school water for lead. Um, and essentially 50% of them um, did not find elevated lead levels, but 44% did. And the argument is that they're in school not that long, particularly now, obviously, with the pandemic, but this is before the pandemic, and that their exposure on a couple sips here and a couple sips there don't really matter. Um, I think people might argue that that's something that's worth looking at, but this is not something that's mandated. Um, there are no federal requirements for schools to test for lead in their water, um, and it's been left up to the states to decide. Um, 41 percent of districts serving 12 million students had not tested for lead in 12 months before completing the survey. 43% of dis districts serving 35 million students tested for lead. Um, of those 37% found ele elevated levels and reduced or eliminated exposures. 16% did not know if they had tested. Um, only eight, eight states require schools to test for lead. Um, and the rest is really voluntary. So you can see that, you know, wherever you stand with lead, we're still getting exposures if kids drinking a lot of water or drinking or filling up their water bottle with school water, we should really make sure that those things are monitored. And those are some of the details I just mentioned. I'm going to skip that. Um, we do know the World, World Health Organization, um, among other reputable bodies, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, neurologic societies, we all know that there's no real safe level of lead exposure. Um, and so that's something to think about. Now, I just added this slide today because I've been reading more and more about fluoride, but of course I post on this in my social media stuff. And I wanted people just to have this as an example of another contaminant that's important to think about. It was introduced in 1945, fluoride. It's on the elements, the periodic table of elements. That's halogen, halogen. it's a halogen, along with iodine, bromine, and chlorine uh, vertically. Um, and um, it was added, there's both inorganic and organic forms of fluoride, but generally the kind that's added to our water systems in the United States is the inorganic form comes from often smokestack scrubbers, um, fertilizer plants. It's not necessarily the organic kind that's drawn from the earth. That's much more expensive. Um, the EPA has set MCL of fluoride at 4,000 parts per billion. Um, this was a source that I believe was uh, recent enough to put that in here, but I want to make sure I'm not wrong on that, but there's been no movement on fluoride in the U.S. Um, lead is still at um, 15 parts per million and arsenic at 50 parts per billion. So you can see that even though fluoride can be as neurotoxic, that's been found to be as neurotoxic, uh, thyroid toxic, um, and pineal gland toxic, um, as perhaps even other chemicals like lead and arsenic, we still have a much higher um, maximum contaminant level. Um, I don't have enough time to go into the, the details of the health effects, 
Um, but it's been so compelling, the information now that it's been removed. Florida has been moved from drinking water from uh, a number of countries, as I've listed a few here. I think Switzerland is also in here that I didn't put on the list. Um, so we now knew me, people are moving far away from fluoride. Um, there was a recent study that showed reduced IQ in newborns exposed from moms that were drinking fluorinated water. So that's one place I would de definitely start. Um, but we'll talk about it. The American Dental Association still defends the use of fluoride in many dental products. Um, they have taken it out of some toothpaste that we're all aware of. Like I think Colgate took it out. Um, but we want to think about, um, you know, fluoride in our products and what children swallow uh, versus topical. And that's a debate that we all have to just think about. I myself, as a mom of two young boys, um, did not use fluoride in our water. I use a filtration system, but I did allow for topical use um, at the dentist. And so whether I'm wrong or not, we'll see how that plays out. But again, as the, as the information changes, um, I think we have to be able to read the literature and make personal decisions on these things. PFAS chemicals, perfluoralkyls. Um, I will say about fluoride that the fluoride, the fluorine chemical that's attached, the component that's, that's a halogen is what makes a lot of these chemicals really harmful and forever chemicals because the bonds are very difficult to detach, which makes the chemical very, very hardy in our environment and in our body. But fluorine also competes with iodine that naturally and healthfully sits in our thyroid gland. And so that is one of the mechanisms by which fluorine can affect um, thyroid disease um, and increased risk for thyroid disease um, because of that replacement of a, of a halogen with fluorine, which is also a halogen. PFAS chemicals, similar in, in a sense, they have this fluorine chemical that makes them forever chemical. And they're being found in waterways in, um, in New York, in almost every waterway that's close to an airport or a military base, especially because of all of the military activity and, um, you know, they do all these training sessions with the foams. The foams are made of this perf uh, perfluoralkyl chemicals, also found in nonstick uh, cookware, waterproofing chemical uh, fabrics um, like Gore-Tex. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're, you know, stain guard chemicals, nonstick, degrease. They're on food wrappers that we'd want perhaps not to have grease go through the wrapper. Um, there are often perfluoralkyls um, as a class. There's something in there. So, you know, these are becoming a real problem. Now I know the food packaging industry is trying to figure out how to manage the uproar in terms of replacement chemicals. Um, so we'll see how this plays out, but it's gotten a lot of attention. And even here in Princeton, there was um, water testing to show that perfluoralkyls were in the water. So, you know, again, at the same level over the same period of time. We don't know these are points in time, but certainly um, no one is immune in this country to contaminants, especially harmful ones. As I mentioned, it's in Teflon, fire fighting, fighting foam, all the military bases across the country um, and, and many health effects. They are endocrine disrupting in their nature. They can affect thyroid, but they're also able to, have, to affect insulin production and usage. Um, effects on the immune system. They've been found to lower the ability to respond to vaccines, um, which poses an issue when you want a vaccine to actually work. You don't want to uh, suppress um, the ability to create antibodies. Um, and that has been found to be um, quite an important um, set of studies. And that was not that, uh, that was recent. So we want to really think about these chemicals, if they're going to stay in our blood as much as they are in the environment and what we can do about it in terms of prevention, which is what um, I like to teach, but also what the book Non-Toxic teaches. Um, here we are, just an article on all of the contaminated water sites around military bases and just how pervasive this issue really is um, of PFAS chemical contamination. Um, this was a site off of EWG. Um, you know, and they wanted to really emphasize just really that issue, the pervasiveness. Now, pesticides, you know, we can go into so many different specific chemical contaminants. We can even go into the nucleotides like radon. There's just so much to talk about with water. Um, but I wanted to just kind of hit up some of the big ones. Um, pesticides, we are just inundated. After the 1950s, you know, we really just exploded with environmental pesticides, but pesticides for bugs, when soldiers were going off 
um, to war um, and we wanted to protect, protect them from malaria and other kind of bacteria infestation. But in this country, we just never ever bridled the whole idea of creating pesticides without understanding their risk to human health. Um, I know you'll be hearing from other people in this panel or already have, um, but we'll talk about a few of these chemicals. Um, we just have an enormous amount. We have over, I think, 1,100 um, pesticides listed um, in, in farming. Um, and, you know, they're not required for any major testing or any testing on health, safety, toxicity, particularly in certain populations where they could be more um, affected, such as pregnant women, such as children, such as the immune compromised populations. Um, they're everywhere. Um, they're, they're regulated by the EPA under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA. Um, so the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimated that 50 million people in the United States obtain their drinking water from groundwater that's potentially contaminated by pesticides and other agricultural chemicals. Um, and we know that USGS, United States Geological Survey, shows um, a lot of contamination of pesticides because where do they run off into our waters ways you know, Chesapeake Waterway is just one prime example if you want to read about a case of, of real, a real sad situation of, of that runoff and what it's done to the water and the um, uh, biodiversity and, and, and life in within the Chesapeake Bay. So atrazine um, is probably one of the most used um, pesticides in um, the central part of the United States. Um, it is really quite toxic. Um, colleagues like um, Hayes, Dr. Hayes, I'm trying to remember his first name, um, Tyrone Hayes, who's out of UC Berkeley, did some beautiful TED Talks on this. Um, he's a major researcher on atrazine and could see that actually tadpoles were changing from male into female, that they would have dual um, male and female reproductive structures in waterways that were exposed to very low levels of atrazine, you know, the type of levels that humans would be exposed to. Um, so his work was pretty groundbreaking. Um, so it's definitely worth, um, you know, understanding how atrazine affects our, our environments, but it also gets into our bodies as well. And atrazine is certainly an endocrine disruptor, but also carcinogenic as well. Um, but this is one of the, um, the pesticides that's still widely used in the US. Ah, glyphosate. We're going to hear a lot about glyphosate, I have a feeling, over the next few days. But I have a personal story because glyphosate is sprayed and has been sprayed for the last 20 years out my backyard. Um, and long before I even knew there was any issues with glyphosate or even farming, for that matter. And the irony is it's right outside my back door. Um, glyphosate is one of the nation's largest um, used by volume pesticides. It's an herbicide. Um, it's Roundup. If you buy it in, in one of the big box stores, it's called Roundup, but it's an herbicide. It goes after plants um, and weeds. And you can see just the explosion of glyphosate some from 1992 here to 2013. This is in our book and we do a huge section on glyphosate um, because it's definitely worth noting about all the issues. We know that there were some major legal um, uh, uh, I guess announcements in terms of the payouts, 58 million, I think for one of the lawn um, service workers at a school for having developed, um, I wanna see either multiple myeloma or lymphoma or le leukemia actually, I'm not really sure on that detail, but of course it was sort of the turning point where a lot of cases were starting to tee up um, in terms of the effects of glyphosate with exposure causing um, cancers. Um, and, um, you know, I think we're going to start to see more glyphosate being moved out. I post on my smart human Facebook feed, Twitter, Instagram, it's called the smart human. I post quite a bit of stuff that comes up in the news, whether it's a new blocking of glyphosate in parks and recreations in Miami, um, or whether Mexico just banned glyphosate, which it did. So there's a lot of real time, um, uh, messaging I like to give when I see positive changes in the market. Um, but glyphosate is a, is a real concern. And, um, you know, we've been using more and more of it because the, the herbs, the herbs, herb, it's a herbicide. So the weeds are becoming resistant. And so there's been needing to be more spraying to get rid of the same 
um, weeds that may have been only needing one spray a few years ago, maybe now they need more two sprays for, per season. So, you know, we're getting more glyphosate that's infiltrating our food system. It's getting into honey, it's getting into beer, it's getting into, we talk about all of that in the book, but it's really interesting to see how it kind of, um, it all flows downhill from the actual source of the food to the actual manufactured product. Um, this is my backyard uh, or side yard. And you can see that that field over there is actually not owned by us, but um, for many, many years was sprayed um, once or twice a year with glyphosate. And I would remember it come up and it would burn, it would joggle all the chemical would actually fall out of the side a little and it would burn, it would have like a burn mark all the way up the side. I didn't know what it was. I didn't think about it. So now I know, and now I'm, um, trying to fight it. And so far, so good. I'm working with um, local farmers on these issues, which I hope people will think about for their own backyards. So this is a um, slide just showing how water flows into lower parts of the back background of our water into our, you know, aquifers. Um, there are issues there as well in terms of aquifers, in terms of the lower you go into groundwater, you're also going to get heavy, different metals and different minerals, good, bad, or ugly. And so there's risks to table, to water that's above the surface. And of course, water that's below the surface, they both have their risks. Um, but you can see how things basically get absorbed lower and lower and aquifers do serve as, as, uh, water for our water treatment plants as well. Fracking. Um, has been a really important issue. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail here. I want to watch the clock. Wow. Um, but we are really starting to see a lot of downstream effects of hydraulic fracking in terms of waterways that are being affected, um, leaving these chemicals under the earth um, with mixtures that are not available to the consumer um, and making their way into aquifers and to, into bodies, into wells. Um, we have to be very thoughtful about this process. Microplastics, another fun one. Well, we now know that plastics are breaking down um, and then they'll eventually get to such small sizes that they'll be able to infiltrate water. And um, we're seeing that in certain tap water and certain um, bottled water that was tap water, um, you know, that came from taps. Um, we're seeing this globally that microplastics are making their way into the fish we eat, into their meat, into the fish meat, um, but also into our, our glasses. Here we have a, a from the Guardian plastic fibers found in tap water around the world study reveals. Um, so we're starting to see now what they do clinically to the human body is still unclear. Um, I will say that we don't have any, uh, I, I have not seen any studies personally, maybe someone who's listening does, has seen them, but I have not seen any specific um, study showing some type of an association with specific illness. Um, I think it's because we're just being inundated by too many chemicals in different ways. But um, I think plastics are not anthropologically appropriate to be in our body. So um, I'll leave it at that. All right. So nearly 77 million people. Um, this is a report by NRDC. Um, let me just get to my notes here. This is by the NRDC, which is the uh, Natural Resources um, Defense Council, found that 90% of violations um, of the, uh, of the water systems of the Safe Drinking Water Act were not even reprimanded. Basically no actions were taken. Um, and you can see that there are just violations all the time in 2015, 80,000 violations that impacted, um, drinking water systems in every state, which is around 27 million, basically one in 12. So there's violations happening all the time, but they're not being rep reprimanded and they're not necessarily having to pay any fines. Um, and there's usually no repercussions and no formal action taken. Um, so in this particular report, you can see the list of bad actors in terms of their um, report, in terms of their penalties. Uh, yay, New Jersey, I love to, I love my state, but I, I also throw it under the bus because we are a prime example of, of some pretty, you know, bad legislation that needs to be fixed nationally, not just in New Jersey. Um, but we were ranked fourth um, amongst drinking water violations. This is 2017. I wonder if this will make its way to, uh, to uh, Murphy. All right, so here's the report card on infrastructure. So let's talk about engineers. Let's talk about the people who actually have to deal with our water systems in terms of how they're designed and built and what they can do. We now know that New York, because I gave this talk in New York a few years back, um, New York has a waste, a uh, drinking water uh, grade of C or C minus, but C for drinking water. Okay, so that doesn't bode well. And these are the the um, 
me see who, if I have the uh, name of them. Yes, this is from the American, so American Society of Civil Engineers, a uh, team of engineers that, you know, across New York State. Um, and so this is a respected group. It's the ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, what do the grades mean? Basically, a C represents mediocre, requires attention. Um, general signs of deterioration requires attention, um, significant deficiencies in conditions, increasing vulnerability to risk. So I wouldn't want to go for a C. Um, now here's New Jersey's report card. Their drinking water was, um, let me see, where does it say? Bridges, ports, parks, levees, solid hazards, waste. Drinking water was a C also. So we tied with New York. Same, it's from the American Society of Civil Engineers. That was in 2016. Cumulative risk of an analysis of carcinogenic contaminants in the United States is a very important article, a, med a medical journal article that came out. Um, and this was in, uh, it looked at 2010 to 2017, um, a period of that time. It looked over 100,000, uh, it indicates that over 100,000 lifetime cancer cases could be due to carcinogenic chemicals in tap water. That was their um, assessment. Um, majority of this risk is due to the presence of arsenic, disinfection byproducts, and radioactive contaminants. So um, again, this was something that just came out not too long ago, and um, it was pretty striking. Um, another interesting story, Americans chilling problem with tap water safety. So you'll see a lot of this, this is 2020. Um, this was in the Washington Times, November 16th, 2020, an op-ed. And I believe that was around the time that that previous article came out about cancer risk. So what can we do about it? I want to spend, yeah, we have a decent amount of time to talk about it. So let's talk about what we do with our water and how do we clean it up and, and get it together? Because if we're waiting for legislation, it's like waiting for Goodell, we're never going to we're never gonna to get to where we need to be given all the contaminants that we are exposed to. So I wanna make sure I leave people with something tangible. EWG um, has a tap water database. You can go to Environmental Working Group. They're very good for a lot of things, including looking up personal care products, looking up cleaning products, very reputable group. We use them a lot in our book, Non-Toxic. Um, so, you know, this should say 2020, but essentially they have a tap water database where you can type in your um, zip code. Um, is it perfect? No, um, but it's it's a good way to get started. It's a good way to engage patients or family members to really start to think about this issue and maybe help motivate them to the next steps, it's, which is filtering. We want to filter our water. We want to filter our water at what's called the point of use, which means that no matter what uh, municipal tap system, wastewater treatment plant sends your way, through PVC piping and lead piping and breaks in the piping where there's you know, fertilizers and chemicals from farming or what have you, when it gets to your home is when you have the greatest control over what is in your drinking water and therefore what goes into you. And so um, what's really important is that you, know, you can have a well, you can have municipal tap, doesn't matter if it comes up from the ground, if it goes you know, through from you know, um, 20 miles away, you're controlling the contaminants at the point of use. Um, so there are many types of filtration processes that you can use. We're not gonna have time to go through all of them in detail, but I wanna give a smattering so you can understand. And then of course, um, I will hold up the book because I'm proud of it. It's Non-Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World, which does go into greater detail, um, a whole chapter on drinking water, because it's that important. Um, and to start with, you know, these look like they are basically carbon block filters, um, which means a big chunk of carbon in there it could be granulated carbon, like in the, in the picture above, um, which is kind of like, um, you know, granulated. It's not like a solid piece. It's kind of looks like sand almost, but black sand. Um, essentially, these are reasonable ways to take out a decent amount of lead, chlorine, um, and um, some other contaminants, um, some detergents. But they are all dependent on certification, specifically NSF uh, certification is the best way to judge. Um, and um, let me see, NSF um, Hold on, I wanna just give you some more information. But anyway, um, essentially there's certification processes that we'll talk about 
um, you know, whether you have carbon block or granular, um, how much water spends sitting in granular versus around carbon block is, you know, basically um, helps determine how many contaminants are actually removed and how much. Um, so the longer the time spent around these uh, filters, the more they're going to be pulling uh, contaminants. If the water is running fast, you're going to have obviously less ability to pull and extract contaminants from rushing water versus slow process uh, where water is slowly cleaned. Um, pitchers usually you fill up and they kind of just um, run the water through those um, carbon granular carbon or carbon block. And so then you're, you're getting clean water underneath. Whereas a faucet, certainly it goes a little slower because there's nowhere to store the water. Um, so that's one type. Um, there's lots of types you can put in. Your refrigerator has carbon block typically. Um, and, um, and as I mentioned, pitchers, there's distillers, ion exchange, UV filters, water softeners, there's all different types of filtration systems for people's different needs. But I have now come to understand that, um, although many do have their limitations, for instance, UV filters basically kill bacteria, but they do not, um, affect, um, shelled microorganisms like cryptosporidium, um, and Giardia. So UV filters are not helpful in that area because they can affect the shell of that microorganism as opposed to bacteria and viruses. Um, distilled water, um, depending on which company, again, I'm not a, a specialist in every brand, but I will tell you distillers generally take off minerals as well as many chemicals. Um, so often the water does not have minerals, which I'm okay with, and we'll talk about that because I expect that you'll get your minerals back with fruits and vegetables that are pesticide free. Um, but distillers also have trouble, um, depending on the brand, with VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. So the distillers steam the water and then the contaminants fly up and the good water kind of condensates um, and that's great, but then what if the VOCs and the chemicals are, are with the steamed water um, that actually makes its way into the water? So again, there's ways to fix that by adding carbon components to it. So that's something you have to work out with your distiller company. Um, but the idea is that um, there are a lot of options and it'll do something. Now, my favorite is reverse osmosis. It has its benefits and, and limitations, its pros and cons as well. Um, but it is the most aggressive uh, way to clean water that we as consumers have available to us. And the reason being is because, you know, I looked at books, actually, it was interesting, about 14 years ago, there's a wonderful book on drinking water that I was reading. And at that time, they were writing about how there's this new thing called reverse osmosis, and you can add on different attachments, but it's very expensive. It's very interesting. Now they're not expensive. The good ones, the certified ones, the NFS, NSF certified are not expensive. They're $250, sometimes $300 for good ones. Um, made in America, every single part is what I recommend because you can outsource parts. Um, some of the big box stores will say made in America. And then, of course, they'll outsource the most important parts like the filter portion. Um, so I'm really, really a big fan of reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is used for water in dialysis. My dad and my brother are both nephrologists. And so we debated out why are we making sure nationally under federal law that RO filters are used to clean water that goes into dialysis patients, but they're not adjusting or fixing that for everyday citizens that don't have renal problems or, or are on dialysis. So these are the kinds of things that kind of boggle my mind, but you know, RO filters, typically good ones that are certified will have different components. As you can see, here's a sediment component, a carbon block component, the membrane, which is typically the RO component, uh, which is super thin. The micron of, portion si of pore size is so small that it actually catches viruses and uh, which are the smallest particulate matter, um, radon, some of the nucleotides. Um, and so there's all different additions you can make to it, but in general, an RO filter takes time to wash the water, essentially go through all that surface area, and then it drip, 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 drip slowly into a tank. There's no way you can use an RO filter specifically at your shower head, but you can get a whole house filter. Um, that's reverse osmosis, quite expensive, um, but depends on your priorities, of course. Um, 
The um, tank water basically is what you're drawing off of when you drink um, drinking water or use it to cook with cooking water. So um, again, cost effective. Now it does in fact use a lot of water, it wastes water. So if you are in a state like California where water is monitored very closely and charged for, then you're gonna think about how much you use to drink and cook because that's all you're paying for is essentially the amount of what you drink and cook um, because it shouldn't waste water while the tank is full. Um, but in order to create on average about one gallon of water, of drinkable purified reverse osmosis water, you're going to waste about anywhere from three to five gallons of water that goes out and that you pay for. So that's what I want people to think about in terms of cost effectiveness for their own situation. This is one of the filters in my RO filter. Literally every time we change it out, I live in farmland. I don't know where that water's been before it reaches our house, but certainly there's enough sediment and enough goop. I tried to get this tested, but they required that I give them the name of the chemical to look for. And it was $50 each chemical. And I thought, you know what? There's just too many chemicals to spend money on. I'd rather put it in other places. So um, I would just say that this doesn't look healthy. And this is what I get in my water about every 12 months when we change out the filters, 10 to 12 months. EWG has a wonderful um, online and uh, online site for tap water and guide to water filters. Um, I also say transport your water. What, what's the irony of carrying clean, super wonderful water in junky containers like BPA uh, plastic bottles or BPA free, which is nonsense. They just replace BPA with BPS, BPS IP. Um, so don't ever think that plastic is safe if they even label it because um, there are many other chemicals that are being used in substitutions. We now call them regrettable substitutions. And so I recommend stainless steel and glass, which are inert. They don't have any, um, especially glass, no an, an activity. And so when you have distilled water, um, it's considered water that's aggressive that will pull often a lot of times chemicals from plastics if it's stored in plastic because it's um, been removed of its minerals. So it's active, it's aggressive, it needs to pull from somewhere. So again, with distilled water, um, you wanna be careful to make sure you store it in glass, um, but pretty much all in glass would be great. Plastic water bottles, um, this is a huge topic and I certainly wanna save time for questions, but this is a huge topic. So the US Food and Drug Administration um, basically manages, here, let me go on this. The, the, food, the bottled water industry is managed by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. However, the Safe Drinking Water Act, which just covers 91 chemicals, which is not great, doesn't even apply to bottled water. They're exempt from bottled water for, for the Safe Drinking Water Act. So those 91 chemicals are not even tested or required to be tested because if they're sent, brought in from other states or what we call intrastate bottles, then you're, they're not required. I don't know why, it just blows my mind. So of course, all water is interstate, you know? Um, and so they're not required. So at the state level, um, there can be some requirements at the state, um, but that's even often not overseen very well. And then there's the International Bottled Water Association or IBWA, which is a private trade group, which, is, which does have stricter standards than the FDA. Um, they often use the NSF, which I mentioned is the international um, certification um, for water filters, um, and they'll often use it. That NSF stands for National Sanitation Foundation International. So um, you want to look for that on anything you buy for filtration. Um, but essentially, most bottled water, plastic bottled water is um, tap water, municipal tap water, which we already know is pretty dirty. Um, also bottled water travels often it sits in warehouses in hundred degree weather. I have a great picture of that in my book that just, I'm at a light in Cape May, New Jersey in hundred degree weather, watching these pallets of water just sitting there for like a half an hour. I just sat there and it was hundred degree and they were just sitting there waiting to be loaded up on a non-refrigerated truck. So before it gets to your refrigerator, it's been sitting in hot temperatures, potentially traveling. And, um, and that just bodes not well for the contaminants from the plasticizers in those bottles. Um, so it's really important to think about. Now, many of these have the plastic chemical PET or polyethylene tetraphthalate, um, which is also recycling code number one in the triangle. 
Um, and the big issues with some with one and two in the triangle is is really um, antimony, which is uh, on the elements chart, um, which can have carcinogenic properties. Um, but mostly, it's the phthalates, DHP, that are often in the in the bottles that are endocrine disruptors. And some really interesting studies that we put in in the book, which I'll hold up again. Um, is when they were growing snails in plastic water bottles. And you could see changes in growth and development in the pregnant snails um, because there was low level estrogenic activity. There's plenty of great studies that have now shown that plastic bottles do produce low level um, phthalate uh, contaminants that increase risk for estrogenic components to their experiments. Um, in terms of exposure. And so we did list some really good studies that were well done to kind of illustrate that um, in case you have relatives uh, or kids like myself who insist that they want plastic water bottles all the time. So, you know, you have to work with people, but we wanted simple studies that were really well done and easy to share with uh, people as well. Ah, he was on my way back from Cape May. This is not even the one at the, at the red light. So this was 100 degree weather, um, just waiting for people to get their bottled water in 100 degree heat. Ah, this is the actual picture. I didn't realize I had it. So I was sitting at a red light, just staring for half an hour. I thought it was a good experiment. And of course, even at a half an hour, no one came out to lift it into the truck. Boxed water is better. Well, maybe for the environment, but you know, we do know that there's a plastic lining to all Tetra packs and to all cartons. Does it mean we should all just throw up our hands and stop buying all this stuff? Probably not. Um, I mean, I'm doing my best to try to find things in glass, but it's not easy. Um, you know, I would say if you're going to get water, you're saving money by getting a water filtration system in your house and just filling up at home. We, we take three bottles to every sports game, um, you know, so it's just cheaper. You'll know where your water comes from 80, 90 percent of the time, depending on how much you eat out. Um, but again, we're thinking here environmental as opposed to greening our body, which is very critical is thinking about how our body stays healthy as well from exposures, not just our environment. Um, again, the tap water database, um, you can get reports and testing from this zip code um, from EWG, but you can also require your, you are allowed and municipal taps, uh, wastewater treatment plants, sorry, are required to give an annual report. Um, to their residents that they serve in terms of what are the um, contaminants that hit the MCL maximum contaminant limit um, and what they did about it. So I think that's really important to think about, about getting your annual report. Um, may inspire you to get a different type of filtration system, depending if you live in an area with high amounts of radon versus um, areas that have a lot of um, farm runoff where I live. Um, versus uh, industrial, you know, buildings. Um, I think it's all really important to think about. You can also look up Superfund sites in terms of where you live in the country and how many Superfund sites are close to you or military bases, because all of them have risk to what the contaminants are around those areas. Um, here's a sample annual water quality report um, that you can get off the internet, but essentially it'll tell you what it hit in terms of the MCL, what's the cutoff, what they hit, and, um, and even if they um, remediated the problem, how they did that. So I'm back to basically just take home messages and we'll go to questions. Um, it looks like I have a, a clock that says when I'm getting yanked off. So that's good to know. Municipal and well water in the US is a source for contamination and, a potential, and potential health effects. No question about it. I think it's a major problem that people aren't thinking about. Um, and it should be prioritized. I don't think any patient of mine leaves the office without enough information to get going with water filtration. So that's a priority in my, in my world. Um, filter at the point of use, as I mentioned, at your tap, whether it's a pitcher, whether it's reverse osmosis, whatever you're doing is worth it. Even kids in college, I have a lot of college students that are my patients. I teach them how to manage living in different apartments. Um, moving from dorm room, how you can create this world of cleaner water as best you can within the confines of your situation. Um, carry water and stainless steel and glass, avoid, avoid sports bottles that say BPA free. Um, again, BPA free means nothing in the United States. It means that they've often, not always, but often put in substitutes like BPS, BPSV, um, BPSIP, and these have been shown to actually not only been just as bad as BPA in terms of its endocrine disruption capability, 
um, an immune system disruption, but also um, it's they've been shown to be worse um, in many tests uh, in many journal articles. So we really want to think about labeling. I say stay away from plastics as much as possible with cooking, from drinking, food storage, um, manage drinking water, especially in pregnancy and the elderly and the immunocompromised. It's really kind of critical when you're creating fetus. Um, it's not to blame certainly is not my intention. I didn't know better when I was pregnant. It's really about educating in a very reasonable way. Um, there's no one to blame here, um, perhaps the government, <laughs> um, but there's no one individually. If I, as a doctor who has taken every science class from here to JPIP, didn't know a thing about environmental health only 10 years ago, I cannot imagine um, you know, how we would expect individual consumers to know without doing it on their own in some way, because doctors aren't teaching this. So um, they're not teaching it in med school, so they're not teaching it to patients. So um, I just urge people to really educate people in a way that just doesn't feel like you shut them down, but really empowers them. And the book was written in such a way that it's not meant to shout, it's meant to educate and empower. That was important. Um, use bottled water when you know there's an emergency contamination. Of course, if you're you have a flood situation or a major, you know, tornadoes or what have you, you know, bottled water is necessary when you travel. If you don't have your own bottle, of course. But when you can control drinking water about 80% of your time, I think that's a huge win. Knowing what we know how, about water. Um, some more quick tips. If you're drinking tap water, which a lot of people still do, even my family members, I'm like shocked to hear this. Um, but you let it run a full 10 seconds in the mornings before you drink it. And then maybe at a slower half the flow, because the, you, you have lead that's stuck in pipes overnight, stagnant water. Um, you can get lead and other contaminants. And when you turn it on fast speed, you're also releasing that from the sides of the interior of those pipes. So again, 10 seconds, then slow down the, the drizzle to fill your water container. If you're going to drink tap water, if you're just stuck and you have no other way to manage water, of course. Um, for hot water, actually use cold water and then heat it up because the, the heat actually increases contaminants. Um, so you really don't want to run hot water to drink it or cook with it if you can avoid it. Store all removable pitcher parts and systems in the fridge. Of course, there's microorganism growth. Um, just from drinking from plastic bottles, we contaminate the bottle with our own mouth microorganisms. But, you know, in, individually, it's not a big deal, but you don't want to just keep drinking from water um, beyond a 24 hour period, 20, 36 hour period, because you can get actually some illnesses from that. Store open bottled water in a fridge, as I mentioned, not in the sun, even closed bottled water, you wanna stay away from the sun because you don't want heat if there is contamination. Check your free annual water report. As I mentioned, avoid water from carboys, plastic water delivery companies. People swear by them and I understand. Listen, I, I was there too. I was schlepping water bottles for, I don't know, seven years um, prior to getting um, a water system, a reverse osmosis water system. And boy, does it pay itself back in no time to get an RO system that's certified and well vetted. Um, but then also it's the schlep factor. You don't have to pick up bottles and, you know, all the other risks that go along with plastic and, and the earth and contamination. So um, I, I try to get people to think about that. Wells test for bacteria, nitrates, and a bunch of other contaminants at least once a year, even if you're not selling your property, which is required. Um, so you should do that willingly if you're going to be showering with that water, perhaps, even if you're not um, cooking with it. Um, so just think about that. So these are some of my resources. Um, I think they're all reputable. Um, but uh, so, so I, you can certainly screenshot that, but they're basically available online. One of my favorite pictures and my favorite quotes, let us not look back in anger or forward in fear, but aware, but around in awareness. And that's really my whole MO is to get us to think about being proactive to doing for ourselves and our families, um, and not waiting for someone to do this or our government to come into place. There are people that are working very hard on Capitol Hill and trying to make these things happen in terms of legislative change. That's not my area. And I want to keep my energy in my lane. And um, if you have a lane that you feel like you can make some real strides in, go for it. Um, educate others. Certainly more resources, um, many of which were already covered there. Um, if you're interested in a TED Talk, if you want to share it with your kids, your students, your patients, this is 13 minutes. Um, this is basically the data that I collected from two pilot projects at Princeton High School. 
um, trying to figure out if the kids were even interested in environmental health, what environmental health was, and then a series of lectures talking about drinking water one day or personal care products and looking up chemicals in their products. So I got the data that these kids not only wanted, they really wanted it and were the prime demographic to do so. So that's going to be my life's work. But the te this TED Talk, I hope, is entertaining because it really kind of goes through the story of my dog all the way to where I am now. Um, and it's not very long. So this is the final or one of the final slides. These are the two textbooks, or te two books. The first is a textbook um, that was written through Oxford University Press with my partner, Dr. Fred Vomsall who many of you may or may not know, um, was largely responsible for having BPA, for getting BPA um, removed from baby bottles in 2012. That was the only place they could get it out of, mind you, even though it was found to be an endocrine disruptor. The first one that was incredibly well studied, that was his work and his colleagues. Um, so he has been my partner. Um, he's phenomenal. And um, we did that for Andrew Weil's um, integrative academic series. Um, which is a wonderful series. And then we jumped off from that into a consumer book with Oxford University Press. And this is, I think, the culmination of, I would say, nine years of figuring it out, figuring out what I wish I had at the time to figure this out, and then kind of giving it back to people to help them make decisions as they choose um, in their journey to remove chemicals. So it gives the historical background, the regulatory issues, the you know, the wins, the failures, but then it goes into real practical options, what to do for all of the different scenarios we bring up. So I hope people will check that out and maybe give it to a teenager or, um, a, you know, someone who's trying to get pregnant or, or anybody. It's good for everybody at every age group. And then for those of you who may want to, you know, who are on social media, this is really my baby in terms of my education work. I try to post Monday, Wednesday, I do post Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Facebook, Instagram, probably three times a week. Um, the podcast has really interesting people that I was managed to pull from um, environmental health research and lawyers in environmental health and just really topics that I was psyched to learn about and also colleagues that wrote chapters in previous years. So I hope people will check out the podcast. It's an environmental health podcast, but it's, it's filled with a lot of flavor, I hope. Um, but please follow and share with family, friends. It's meant to um, be entertaining on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The website is thesmarthuman.com. And that's really the end of my talk. So I hope you'll support. This helps me get grants to teach high school and college. So the more supporters, the better. So thank you very much. I don't sell anything either. I don't sell or monetize it at all. All right, Ben. Hey, Dr. Ailey Cohen, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And when I say amazing, I mean really uh, incredibly eye-opening, I know, for all of us. And um, there's really no great words to thank you enough. So thank you. I, uh, I don't know if it's literally toxic green sludge, so I probably shouldn't say it, but I don't think I'm going to get that image out of my head of your filter. Oh, my God. Isn't so, that shocking? And it's reproducible every year. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's very eye-opening. So thank you for everything that you My shared. Yeah, we do have a few minutes for questions and the way we've been working it for those that are just joining us the first time, some of you already know, what we want you to do is click on your reactions tab on your uh, Zoom tools. And when you click on your reactions tab, you can click raise hand. And when you click raise hand, we will see your hands come in in the order in which they are received. We'll go ahead and have you unmute yourselves to ask Dr. Ailey Cohen a question. And, um, and so with that, we do have a few questions coming in. So if you're all set, we'll go for it. Sure, I'll do my best. Great, thanks doc. Okay, so our first one, uh, Suzanne, we're gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself, please. Hi, Suzanne. Oh, Suzanne, I see you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. Mm. Suzanne? Yes, is that better? Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you. Sorry about that. So thank you very much. Um, I feel like I needed a paper bag for that session to breathe into. So just catching my anxiety here. Thank you for it, though. Um, my question. So there was a mention that like nobody's really talking about water, I guess, in the Western health space. But I'm curious because a lot of the countries that have kind of banned, you know, fluoride, for instance, in other countries and indigenous cultures within our own country here in America have been talking forever about how water is life, basically. So I'm curious, like what we can do as we talk about integrative health in ourselves and in our 
quote unquote modern culture and to kind of integrate ourselves with other cultures that have been talking about this forever. And by kind of bypassing their ancient wisdom, we end up with all these modern problems. And I'm just curious, like how do we integrate ourselves as a humanity to solve this global issue that affects us so deeply in terms of being able to just drink water? You know, wealthier people can go and get glass bottles, but can poor people go and do that? But it affects us all, you know? So thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I think your question is really a great question. I would say that from my perspective, having just trying to educate Western physicians, um, having to just try to get this as a thought in medical schools. Um, you know, it's shocking that we can't get into the heads of people who are already working to supposedly heal. Um, I, you know, I don't think that all doctors are bad. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I work with all of them. I think it's just the training and the system that's really terrible because if you're not even teaching nutrition, which is now five hours and four years of medical school, um, to the people who are supposed to utilize this information for prevention of health issues, you know, then the question is, well, how do you make a culture respond to water even nationally or globally as a consumer, um, you know, it's, it's a real, it's a real pickle. Um, I think when people are taught how it affects them personally, that's always the best way to get through to people is to hit them in their kishkas, in their heart. Um, I think when you can relate to something that may have been from a water exposure um, that may have contributed to an autoimmune disease or some type of chronic illness, um, and relate those two topics is not so much a cause and effect because we don't have that information, but, but an association, I think you start to get people to listen. When you show images of your water filter that looks like that, it starts to get people curious. But in terms of indigenous people, I mean, God knows we, we've been the connection between water. And I just did a talk for on climate change for one of the schools here in Princeton. And the whole motive of my talk was to get people to think that we are not separate from the earth, that our bodies are like the earth. We have biodiversity in our gut. We have biodiversity on our earth, that you can make these incredible connections between our actual bodies and the makeup of our bodies and the makeup of our earth. And when we screw up one, we screw up the other. They're all interconnected, they're symbiotic. And I think when you can draw those kind of metaphors and people are like, oh yeah, you know, and then you layer in some of the, you know, information of the indigenous um, populations and people who have known this all along. It's just that, you know, we like our stuff. And so people disregard things that don't make us overweight or give us pain. Thank you, doctor. And up next, we have Jill. Jill, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Yes, thank you. Could I just ask you what brand of the osmosis filter do you use? And is it for like the whole house or just on the kitchen sink? Yeah, I'm, I don't share brands. I don't talk about brands. Um, I, that's part of why I feel like I'm legitimate in what I do. I refuse to take any of that kind of endorsements or even now, do I think it would be helpful? I kind of do, but I just don't do it. But I will give you enough information so you wouldn't have a hard time finding one. Um, so the reverse osmosis water filters, um, you don't want to be sucked in by the big water groups that come to homes and make you believe you have to worry about just the smell or the look, or if it's hard or soft. Hard and soft means too many calcium and, and magnesium minerals versus soft is too few. Uh, in most cultures, hard water is actually better for human health because we're deficient in a lot of really good minerals. But the companies that come in, a lot of them, and I can't say all of them, but a lot of them will really sell you on some of the least toxic of the um, the harmful contaminants like um, sulfur chemicals, and they'll get your water to taste better or to look better, but they won't necessarily be cleaner. I say, forget the big companies and really look, um, even online, there's very good um, certified NSF, which um, stands for, what did I say? Uh, National Sanitation Foundation International, but NSF, um, uh, Consumer Reports does a nice job of this. this is how we fought, we got our RO filter was off of Consumer Reports 20 years ago. Um, but they are rated in terms of what they are able to um, remove. And the more components, 
as I mentioned. So ours has three RO filters just for our kitchen. We did not invest in a whole house, although I'd like to do that one day. I just didn't have the money with two kids and whatever we were doing elsewise. Um, but maybe we will do it one day because um, you can get carbon filter shower heads at a local big box store for like 20 bucks. So you can put those on the showers um, and then you can get an RO filter for your kitchen, which is really what we do. It doesn't take up any space anymore. It's gotten smaller and smaller and they run about 300 bucks on sale, sometimes 250. Um, we order ours from California um, where they make it in California. Um, I've interviewed them for books. I've interviewed them for stuff. And I understand a lot of it in terms of pore size, how small that pore size, whether it's a dowel filter versus not a dowel filter, whether they outsource components. You should ask all of these questions. When PFAS chemicals became a big deal, um, I called them up and asked if, if they could show me some studies that, that remove PFAS from this RO filter and they could. So, you know, you really want to challenge the company you use um, and make sure that they are um, able to show you the proof of their testing, third-party testing. Um, but again, we, I mean, I give it as wedding gifts. I mean, I'll just order RO, I mean, I don't get asked back much, but I order them and people really will put them in at their own time. It might take two years until they move into a, a place they want to put it. But the idea is they're not expensive enough to be um, outrageous and um, and they're removable. You just have to play a pump plumber like 150 bucks for an hour to put it in. You don't need a whole dramatic. I, I'm amazed by the bills that I see people get from some of the biggest water companies in the country when it's just a racket. Hope that Thank helps. You. Thank you, doctor. And um, and up next, we have Renee. Renee, if you'd go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Renee. Hi, thank you so much. That was an incredible presentation. Thank um, you. Yeah, I have a question. I'm wondering about regular drip coffee filters. Is that harmful since the, the water is being heated up in the coffee um, as it's being made? And um, also, yeah. if travel water bottles, the ones that filter, have the little filters inside, are those like effective at all? Or should you just you know, suck it up and buy the water bottle, the bottled water while you're traveling? These are great questions. We actually have a, a believe it or not, I put a travel, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm just telling you about, I have a travel section in there because I wanted people to have some thoughts about the gym, travel. Um, but I'm laughing because my husband is like a huge coffee guy and it's like insane. And, you know, he's so resistant at times to give up things, you know, but he went from a French, a French press that was plastic to a glass one that had plastic parts to one that has stainless steel and glass. I mean, he, it's been a journey, you know, like everything in I'm talking about is a journey, right? It's change. We don't like change. Humans don't like change. We like our stuff, but you can do things one by one, which is how I kind of want people to think about the book. So don't get overwhelmed. Just pick one thing that means something to you and then work on cleaning up that habit. For my drinking tea, um, I went from just organic, I went from non-organic tea to organic tea. I thought that was huge, right? Well, the container I had it in was junk. You know, um, my creamer wasn't organic. My, uh, my tea, my sugar wasn't organic. Then we heard about plastics and tea bags and that went in the book and microplastics. So then I went to loose leaf tea. Um, so there's all these iterations until I felt like, ah, oh, I got it. I think I have the most non-toxic habit here. And, you know, he had to do that. So back to your, your question. I mean, look, the, the plastic pods are not good for the environment. Do they run through hot water through the plastic pods? Yeah. Um, has there ever been a study that showed increased rates of, you know, DHP and all the phthalates in people who drink pods? No, I'm not that I'm aware of. It'd be a good study, but they're expensive. So, you know, as a precautionary principle, you want to avoid things that just make sense. So my husband now does organic beans with a kind of a metal bladed chopper. And um, I think he uses a French press. I don't know. It's too early for me. But the idea is that he's getting there. And um, you cut back where you think. I mean, I color my hair. It's not my TED talk. I literally threw myself under the bus. I'm not changing my hair anytime soon, but it's a chemical exposure that I'm willing to, for at this time, keep going but cut everything else off. So I think people have to just make these choices and not feel bad about not making some choices. And I think that's how people get the most done. If I answer the question, let me see, travel. Uh, I think they're getting better and better, the travel bottles that have the like carbon filters, but then I find that they're in plastic bottles. 
they're not glass with carbon block. So I'm waiting to see how those go. And then I might just buy a bunch and sell them in my office. But I just haven't invested yet because I don't like the fact that they're not 100% what I want. Um, but I do believe in a little bit here and a little bit there. So why not? If you're going to do a lot of traveling, you have to use um, public water. Then it makes sense to at least filter if you want. It's better than bottled water, plastic, but often those are just taps. So you're better than that anyway. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. And, and now we have uh, Gregory. Gregory, if you'd go ahead and unmute, please. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Yes, uh, so I had a question just regarding um, water filter and home filtration. So I bought a filter, just a little pitcher filter for what that is an alkaline filter. And I, I was wondering what are your thoughts on alkaline versus uh, just you know regular, regular filter that would just give you like spring water or something like that. I love your question. I get it every single talk. Um, especially people who are into health and nutrition and weight working out and all that stuff. So the whole industry of alkaline water to me is, to me is kind of BS. And I'll tell you why, because, um, you know, we can get our systems, our body regulates on its own. Our kidneys are magical, right? So we're already managing our pH through our kidneys. If you have healthy working kidneys, um, you can get alkaline a system blood through just fruits and vegetables because they're alkaline in general, um, especially if they're pesticide free, which can affect the pH, but you want to at least try to get pesticide free uh, produce, whether it's frozen or fresh, I don't care because it's still pesticide free. Um, and the water in order to clean out those tiniest of contaminants, viruses and bacteria, but all the way to the phthalates and the bisphenols and the flame retardants and the heavy metals and all the sewage, everything that's in water, you have to take everything out to clean it because of the part particulate size. It's just a, it's just a, you know, a filter. So um, my recommendation is get all of that junk out and create an alkaline system through your food um, through produce, through natural whole fruits and vegetables without pesticides. Um, now, as I mentioned, you know, there are some minerals that are very healthy for the human body, right? Calcium and magnesium, and they come from, you know, aquifers and deep, deep parts of the earth where they pulls the water up for wells, certain wells. And, but, you know, to just, to, to get those out and not to get the chemicals along with it makes it, it's impossible. So you just want to get those um, minerals from good food that's clean and washed and, and, and ready to go. So I think, you know, reverse osmosis or even distilled, um, which removes a lot of chemicals as well, um, depending on the system, I think that's the way to go. All the other stuff really just kills bacteria, but doesn't take off chemicals like, you know, boiling water that the chemicals are still there. It's just the um, microbes are killed. So, you know, you, so I hope I answered your question, but I, I drink RO filter and then I eat plenty of fruits and vegetables that are cleaned and washed and I think that that's a great way to get best of both worlds. Thank you so much for that, doctor. Um, and quite frankly, thank you for everything. This has been truly, truly amazing. We wanna make sure everybody knows that if you wanna find out more, uh, Dr. Cohen already mentioned it, but you can go to aliecohenmd.com. You can see it on the screen here. And of course, check her out at the smarthuman.com as well. Really an amazing, amazing place. And um, you know, if you folks aren't getting it, like we don't even know that we don't even know this stuff. And she's gone out there and done the work for us. So your books, your websites are also meaningful. And this lecture has been tremendous. Um, so with that said, um, I want to remind everybody to come back here in an hour at 2 p.m. Eastern for our next lecture. But before we get there, um, I wish I had the words to thank you, Dr. Cohen, but mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you on behalf of our audience. But I think we should do you one better. How about our tech team unmutes everybody? And if you would all thank Dr. Cohen, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. 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 Thank you.